Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this meeting of the uh, World Watch Car Authority, um, including our budget uh, this evening. Um, I'll come on to incidents, obviously. Yeah, I need to be mic'd up here. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. I knew you could in the room. But we have uh, uh, Catherine Richardson here from the uh, HMI, and we're very pleased to have you with us here this evening, Catherine. Um, and I don't know if you're going to show, show yourself on the, on, the, on the screen. I'm sure members would like to meet you and see you, but uh, that's entirely up to you. I'm not drawing her in, am I? Okay, okay. So let's let's get started with apologies for that. There you are. There you are. Well, Good evening, thank you. <laughs> Pleasure. Apologies for absence, please. Uh, yes, Chair, we've received apologies from, yes, from councillors Werner, Dar, Shah, and Brown. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so then we've got the declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest to be stated? I see none. Minutes of the meeting held on the November 2023, 8th of November, page 716. Um, of course, clearly you look at actions, and there are no extant actions there or actions going forward. Uh, might I look for a member to propose Councillor Shep Dubay? Are you seconding, Councillor? Very grateful for that. Unless there are any other comments, I'm going to ask for a show of hands to accept the minutes, please. 8th of November. Thank you very much for this. Okay. Petitions and questions for the public on selling order 19 and 25. Okay. Uh, so I'm into chairs and announcements. Um, members will be aware and it is with great sadness that we learnt of the passing of Wayne Brown, the Chief Fire Officer for West Midlands Fire and Rescue Service. Wayne had dedicated his life to the fire service, having served 28 years in London Fire Brigade before joining West Midlands Fire and Rescue Service in 2019. The service has offered its condolences to Wayne's family, friends and colleagues at West Midlands Fire and Rescue Service. On behalf of Royal Berkshire Fire Authority, I would like to express our deepest condolences to Wayne's loved ones, friends and colleagues at this incredibly difficult time. Our thoughts remain with them following this tragedy, and as a sign of respect, I would ask you to rise and join me in a minute. Thank you very much. I don't want the chimes added in anything to it. Okay. Thank you. I've got an update here on culture. At the beginning of the year, the Independent Culture Review in South West Wales, South Wales <coughs> Fire and Rescue Service was published. Since then, the senior leadership team has been reviewing the report our senior leadership team to ensure any relevant learning is kept. As the report is very comprehensive and detailed in nature, we want to make sure that the balance is taking the appropriate time to thoroughly review it in order to identify the relevant learning for the service. 
The senior leadership team will ensure this learning is fed back into the service and the plans that underpin our culture and values. I'd like to assure members that I will, I will keep you all updated as we continue to explore this report and its implication of both, both the service and the sector. And members will be aware of actions taken in South Wales Fire and Rescue Service since uh, in the last uh, eight, two weeks. Um, so you'll be watching that carefully. It's quite an extreme thing for the uh, government to have done. But um, we will look to see what we can learn from that report. And I don't know what the time is going to be on that, Chief, but I think it's going to be very much. Next slide, Paul. Next slide, Paul. Thank, thank you. Good authority. Very good. Thank you. Members also will be uh, followed an incident that occurred in Reading last week. Um, I would like to update members on some of the outstanding work undertaken by some of our crews. In the evening of the 1st of February, the firefighters from Coverton Road, Woking Road, Whitleywood and Thiel were sent to an incident on Southcote Road alongside one officer. They then they discovered a fire on the first and second floor of a block of flats. Firefighters rescued five people using smoke goods and placed them into the cage of the ambulance service before extinguishing the fire. The use of smoke goods allowed us to be evacuated residents through areas of the building affected by smoke and into clear air. I'd uh, like to congratulate our crews who acted decisively to ensure that this incident did not become a tragedy. The speed, efficiency, and professionalism of their responses reflected of the quality of service provided. I do have any updates on the people who were rescued. I think they have a good task of working on getting thrown out. Do you want to know that they could use the So, uh, the, the interesting learning point from this incident, Chair, is the use of the smoke goods uh, in this particular incident, in that there were several people who self rescued who required a saturn in hospital for smoke for the effects of smoke inhalation. Um, but the crews used uh, smoke goods or a family who attempted to self evacuate, but the, the stairwell was filled with uh, thick, acrid smoke, so they returned to their flat and closed the door and were walked out of the building or rescued from the building by the crews using smoke goods, and they were discharged at scene without the need for medical attention. So it shows the value of, of smoke goods and that decisive action taken by the crews and the knowledge of consent by the fire control where to direct the crews to the people uh, who were actually still in the building. <coughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Then, uh, I got to the January floods. Following a period of heavy rain at the start of January, the service was called to respond to severe flooding caused by Storm Hink across the county. There's been a couple of more alphabet soup storms since then. Um, Working alongside partners, our team has dealt with a series of challenging incidents between <coughs> flooding in properties, water rescues, and evacuations. Areas in West Berkshire, and Chris, we are well aware of that, West Berkshire Council, as well as around Rainsbury, were particularly hard here. And firefighters work closely with local authorities, Berkshire, Lone End, Search and Rescue, and Blue Light Partners to support those workers. Uh, during the flooding, the Tempelite Brown Proposal, TV uh, also played a key role in supporting our, um, our response. Control staff operated a triage system of calls and ensured that incidents were filtered for response to an infected mm -hmm. Thank you to everyone who supported the response to floods. The collective efforts of everyone involved in response to the outburst were around how our teams work all well, 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 well together. I think I've got some feedback coming up, so I'm going to go into this one, yeah? <coughs> yeah, thank you. We'll see. That sounds a bit echoey as well, but I'm going to pass it in. We've heard of, of new whole time apprentices. Throughout the winter, the service has been hard at work recruiting the next generation of firefighters in between Barbara. Earlier this month, we welcomed. Earlier this month, <laughs> goes up and down and down. I'm really hanging on my every word for wrong reasons here, aren't you? Um, we've been hard at work recruiting the next generation firefighters in Berkshire. We've opened 18 new whole time firefighter apprentices. These apprentices began their journey to become firefighters 
back in the summer, and we had a reconstruction process before we had to join us. Currently, our newest cohort recruits are on our training course at the Biosecurity College in Modern Marsh in uh, Gloucester. Uh, they will return to Berkshire next month to complete the final few weeks of their training before graduating in early May. And there is a graduating ceremony, which I'm rather hoping is on the afternoon of the 10th of May, because it's my wedding anniversary and I will have to take my wife out in the evening. So I think we're synchronizing that around my wedding anniversary celebrations. Or perhaps not. Um, so we will have that. Um, over the Christmas period, we also launched another full time recruitment drive. Uh, these applicants are now going through the selection process, and I look forward to welcoming the successful candidates in the near future. On behalf of the authority, I'd like to thank everyone who's worked so hard in supporting the recruitment and training of our newest recruits. And I'm sure me members will join me in wishing our new apprentices the best of luck as they embark on the first, first steps of their new career. The service has recently become recruited in the next cohort of interns as part of our summer internship scheme. I don't know if members remember the six people, five, five people last year, who came in and, and did a wonderful job of training us, I think, basically, in how to, how to connect and, and work with young people. And while we were watching them, they were watching us. Um, and they, they were tremendous, tremendous growth. So this is now its third year and the scheme aims to encourage young people who may not have considered a career in the fire and rescue service sector to explore some of the many roles available to them. Really, really good program. Took a lot of work. Thank you to those. Uh, I look at Faith as I know she is you know, helping them and looking after them. Um, so we're looking for five interns who are 18 years old, live in Berkshire, and from groups that are underrepresented in our service. To join the scheme for five weeks in the summer from the 4th of July to the 9th of August. Um, have we had any yet? Um, hang on. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. And the application window uh, has been pushed back to 10th of March. Yeah. I'd like to express my best wishes to all those who are applying. Um, these interns will have the opportunity to gain really valuable real world, real world work experience, transferable skills. They take them into their future. And during the program, they'll take part in learning, development workshops, um, and visits to fire stations. And they did presentations at the end of that, which were extremely professional, really well done. I have a feeling you might, you might have told me this already. One or two of them are already sort of wanting to come back. So, wonderful, wonderful event. Uh, and finally, a uh, member development survey. We're only looking for 10 minutes of your time. And I bet we're going to have to chase like crazy, including me, to get this done. But we're looking for a member development survey. We circulated to members. It will be held from the 16th of February tomorrow for a week, 23rd of February. So, we have no longer than 10 minutes. The results from the survey will be fed back to the Member Development Working Party and all the Audit and Governance Committee. So what do we need to learn? What have we learned? What will enhance our knowledge and our capability? Is that right? Big enough plan? 23rd of February? Don't be late, Brooks. Um, that's it. That's the... Any questions on that? Thank you very much. So... We have issues, that, number six on the agenda, issues arising from the Audit and Governance Committee. And in fact, the recommendation that we only get two reports, two reports, as we referred by the Audit and Governance Committee, and we will look at those, uh, the pay policy statement, number 12, and the Code of Conduct participation, <coughs> number 13. So, uh, we'll cover those in the agenda. Any questions from members understanding all the 30, please? Okay. None. Thank you. And notice of motion? None. I want to recommend to the committee. We're noting the agenda items for the budget and automatic fire alarm. So we're recommending from the management committee on the 6th of February. So we've been through the management committee. We'll go through them again tonight. <coughs> and items 12, pay policy statement 13, code of conduct from the Audit and Governance Committee. So those are recommendations of the committee and we're 
moving straight in to the budget. Um, bear in mind the budget will be a recorded vote. You will be asked to, your, your name will be read out, you know the drill, and you say for or against. But uh, you've heard enough of me, I'm going to ask the lead member for uh, finance, Councillor Smith, to uh, introduce the item, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, good evening. It's a pleasure to introduce the super budget papers that you have uh, for the coming year before you. These are results of an incredible amount of hard work and careful consideration by officers, particularly Conor Byrne. And also with the input the budget working party, which spent five times over the last three months, and also scrutiny by the management committee just last week. Uh, both the budget um, working party and the management committee reports across parliament. Uh, each um, budget working party met and uh, meeting dealt with specific elements of the budget and we've taken on the task of the several components and the general picture, both the challenge and the test that uh, was being presented. We've only, we have ensured that we are planning a viable financial future which will allow both prudent investment <coughs> and sustainable growth. Good God. Put it on. Can we start there again? Yes, I thought I had, yes. The in the system. Okay. Because it's not there. Right. Yes, we have ensured that we are planning a viable financial future which will both allow prudent investments and sustainable growth whilst adhering the principles the authority has agreed over in recent years. In the end, this is de delivering a real value for money, resilient, productive, effective and efficient service for residents for just £81.31 pence per, per Pandy household, and which represents a 2.99% increase over last year, which will be coming to a short bit. This is the maximum we have committed. It is less than a penny a day in increase. Life is full of uncertainties, and this budget is no exception. Where the management committee left things last week, uh, Connor still has some significant unknowns, chief among them as business rate elements from three of the unitary authorities, which we've now got. The position we are in is a balanced budget of not quite £46 million, having moved a small surplus of 346000 into the revenue support for capital project heading. This budget is some 5.5% increase over last year if you exclude all the pension adjustments. Uh, We've now got all the uh, missing information and Connor will tell us the exact positions and you have the exact positions in the, in the papers before you. The papers document savings that have been made, changing and improving the way we do all sorts of things and the pressure we are subject to. Uh, these additional pay, uh, these include additional future pay awards over which we have no control. But we have managed to keep in the budget the additional 10 firefighters which will increase resilience and then also as a hedge against loss of personnel due to retirement and transfer. This is largely balanced by producing notes. Going forward, we have an ambitious capital program with upgrading and standardising our fleet over the next three years, so it is no longer the second oldest in the country. We have a major construction project in the replacement of the training centre down at Whitley Wood, and also we have upgrades planned at Langley and one um, well underway at Slough. And the good news is that these have been funded to a significant extent by the sale of D Road with very limited borrowing in the short term. And in looking at the cost of borrowing, we are well inside our newly imposed self-imposed self limit of 2.5% of finance cost to net revenue stream for the next five years, showing that we have a responsible approach to significant investments to maintain and enhance our modern service. So Colin's going to take us through these documents in more detail, but I have absolutely no problem in supporting and promoting these to you. We have eight recommendations to consider. Connor, would you walk us through the detail, please? Okay, thank you, Councillor Smith. Um, so I'm going to start with the medium term financial plan, which is in Appendix B. Um, so the table on page 18 of the pack um, shows the council tax precepts, um, and for 24 25, that will rise by 2.99%. Um, as Councillor Smith has said, that's an increase of £2.36 per annum for a bandy property. This is below the current rate of inflation, but it's the maximum permissible under the government's referendum principles. In subsequent years of the medium term financial plan, it's assumed that the precept will increase by 1.99% based on forecasts for inflation in the medium term. 
So as, as has been said, we've now received all our funding information. So over the page, you'll see the total funding is 45.964 million, um, and that's 118 more than was shown at uh, Management Committee. So it's made up of three, three income streams, and the 2.99% increase in precepts, together with grades of 1.1% in the council tax base, will provide 29.891 million in council tax income. The authority will see 5.812 million in business rates income. However, the combined collection fund deficits for both council tax and business rates will be 0.404 million. General grant funding from government amounts to 10.665 million. Revenue support grant will increase by 6.7% for 24.25. So this was um, CPI in September. That's what the government uses. Um, however, the year on year increase looks far higher as a specific pensions top up grant has been rolled into our for 24 25. However, this is to be welcomed as previously um, the Home Office provided grants that had only been guaranteed on an annual basis. The government has also committed to guarantee a minimum 4% increase in core spending power, so for us that's worth £770,000. Against this, the government will reduce the services grant by 82% compared to 23-24, so that will fall from £277,000 to £50,000. On page 20 of the pack, um, you'll see uh, efficiencies and savings of £565,000. Uh, these have been built into the uh, medium term financial plan uh, to 24-25. Efficiency plan savings are, are identified throughout the year by um, the efficiency and productivity work streams. So I'm confident that over the coming year, further efficiencies will be identified in subsequent years of the medium term financial plan. And budget pressures are shown on the table on page 22. And pay accounts for three quarters of the total revenue budget. So payables have a significant impact on our ability to balance the budget. Um, payables for both green and grey book staff for 24-25 is seen to be 3.75%, which is below the current rate of inflation, but above the increase in the preset for 24-25. It should be noted um, that the payable for green book staff is 5.4% um, in 23-24, against a, a budgeted increase of 4%. Over the last few years, station staff budgets have been under pressure due to increased overtime costs. There are various factors for the increase in overtime, but in essence, we're operating a very lean crewing model with limited spare capacity. In order to address this capacity issue, a buffer of 10 additional firefighters will be recruited in 24-25 at a cost of £406,000. Um, but this should allow us to reduce overtime expenditure by about 560,000 pounds. The broader economic backdrop is such that staff turnover has increased in recent years, leading to the need to recruit increased numbers of trained firefighters. And this has led to an unavoidable pressure of 275,000 pounds in recruitment and training costs. There are also other unavoidable pressures, such as increases in ICT licensing costs as the service transitions to cloud-based services. The service has also been running with limited resources in several key areas, such as pension administration and operational support. Bids for additional resources to reduce risk and improve performance in these areas have been built into the base budget for the cost of £505,000. Over the last decade, there have been increases to employer contributions for firefighter pension schemes. Some of these increases have been funded by the government, while others we've had to find, find from existing resources. Employer contributions for the firefighter pension scheme will increase to 37.6% from the current 28.8% of salary, and an additional cost of 1.3 million in 2024-25. The government has confirmed it will provide grant funding to fire and rescue services uh, in 24-25 to cover this additional cost. But there is no guarantee of funding thereafter. 
medium-term financial plan assumes government funding will continue in future years at that rate. As mentioned earlier, funding for a previous employee contribution increase um, has been switched from Home Office grant funding to be incorporated into the revenue support grant. Um, table on page 23 shows the impacts of the revenue budget on the proposed capital programme over the next four years. As the capital programme is over £9 million in 24-25, additional revenue funding of £346,000 has been added to the budget for 24-25 only. Uh, capital receipts, the development fund and over £6 million pounds of, of new loans will be used to finance capital expenditure over the next four years. Uh, the tables on pages 23 and 24 show the ratio of financing costs to the net revenue budget. Um, and they show these increase over the four year period, but they do remain affordable within the maximum ratio set by the authority. The final table on page 25 and it shows a balanced budget for 24-25. No bids have been built into years two and four, two to four. As at this stage, the assumption is that new bids uh, will need to be funded from increased efficiency. So I'll, I'll stop there for the moment, Chair. Thank you. I'll look for questions. Uh, Councillor Andrew. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I wonder if I can take us to page 22 um, and uh, about two thirds of the way down the uh, chart, we have the filing grant reduction. Uh, could you just talk us through that? Uh, why is it why is it being reduced, and uh, where does that leave us? <coughs> yes. Yeah, so, in, in terms of the uh, filing grant itself, that um, was. Um, agreed many years ago and was provided to um, authorities to help subsidise the, the cost of um, filing um, service. Um, the government has then made a decision to um, reduce this grant over a five year period, uh, reducing it by 20%. Um, I think they've got one eye in terms of the SFCP and uh, when that comes in, how they want to fund that and how they want to present that. Um, but in essence, um, we've got no control over that. It's just a, a, a government decision to reduce it over a five-year period. Other questions, and of course, into the debate <coughs> proper. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Councillor Smith, others on the Budget Working Party, and Connor Byrne, who's um, brought home a, a very good budget, I believe. Uh, I'll go to the Vice Chair, I'm sure you're coming in shortly. I was particularly keen to support the additional 10 firefighters. There's a, a payback on that in terms of overtime reduces, but equally it gives you much more flexibility. We do have pressures in terms of you know, losing people out, out, out of the service to other brigades. We think London in particular. Just building a buffer, up and down, but nevertheless, it does give us some resilience we, we haven't gotten on uh, extra resilience and I, I'm, I'm really pleased to see that stayed in so um who have i got up first council pauline have your please thank you is that one my people thank you <laughs> okay um i've been a member of the budget working party from the beginning so i've seen it through every iteration um, and I've seen it, it develop this way and that way until we've come to this conclusion. Um, I'd just like to comment on three things in particular from pages 31 and 32. And that's um, about the ways that we're saving money. Firstly, more efficient IT as things have developed there. That, that's really great. Um, the fact that we are able to have 10 additional firefighters, which will stop us having to spend so much money on overtime, which has become you know, worse as the years have gone on, and that, that's a real positive. And also, the um, paragraph above that, the much more focused and targeted safe and well visits, um, so that we don't waste resources, but that we really do focus on the people that need it. And I would like to urge 
all of you who are in charge in your authorities of social services, um, adult social care, children's services, and housing, um, to make sure that somebody in each of those departments has got the specific job of letting the fire authority know of any vulnerable people in their borough. They may already know, that doesn't matter, it's better to be told twice than not at all. And also not only having a designated person um, to keep the fire service up to date, but also to make sure that there's some succession planning as well, because officers do leave and the knowledge often leaves with them. And so that uh, I think is just as important um, despite all of the pressures that have been around us, we've still managed to maintain our complement of pumps. We're still beginning to be uh, able to do the refurbishments of the stations that we wanted, and we're still recruiting for staff. So lots of wins there. The document also shows that we've considered the risks, and the budget's going to be reviewed and we've still got a healthy reserve. So I would like to put it on record, please, as I did at the management committee, my profound admiration for colleague, for Coroner and his colleagues for coming up with this budget in a difficult year and being able to present us with a, a good balanced budget. Thank you very much, Connor, and for your colleagues. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, Vice Chairman, I think that. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I mean, obviously, some of us, we said at the management committee when we went quite exhausted detail through the budget, so apologies, those that were on there, people saying the same thing, but obviously it's for the wider authority, and, it, and there's been some important qualifications, obviously, with the additional information received. I mean, yes, thank you, Connor and, and, and the team um, for the tremendous work in, the, in compiling the budget and also in making sure that this year's budget, it, it, you know, we're within a very very small percentage in meeting it as we as we look at uh, at the budget we set last year so it you know keeps the financial stability authority in, in good order and, and the thanks to you know to council smith and other people who attended the budget working party where we had a again a sort of pretty exhaustive look through the budget which is good because and it was all party we looked at things in detail and obviously members did feedback um you know vigorously and challenged which is what you know effectively what what, what, what we're here for uh, and to make sure that we've got a budget, I think we obviously can. All the parties can can can, can support. I mean, it it does represent unbelievably good value for money for I think for the for, for the people of Berkshire. That you know, that I think that you know, on on the on the most common band, we're talking about seventy pounds a year and roughly and um, a, a two pound less than two pound increase per year for the sort of service that you see, and it's manifested itself in. You know the, the 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 thing that people see are obviously the dramatic rescues. So in so in Reading, there was you know the t situation at Station Hill where we made international the international news with the dramatic you know help with the dramatic rescue by the, by the crane operator, um, and then obviously just it was actually in my ward in the South Coast Road. I know the block of flats very well that the chair referred to in his remarks. That's a very difficult block actually if a fire breaks out there. I can just imagine it. And yet, you know, you, you know, the firefighters arrive incredibly quickly, use the smoke hoods and pull five people out. I mean, this is this is incredibly good stuff. And, and there have been other instances throughout the throughout the year of rescues that obviously we, we, we get told about. But more than that, it is the work that's going on, you know, in the, in the safe and well visits, the work in the community that the fire service does, you know, and also the open days that they run, the money they give charity. I mean, this is all part of uh, making the service so good. And I say, I think. Should we say compared with other blue light services? I know there are structural reasons for it, but I think it does reckon, reckon you know, incredibly good value for money in, in certainly in, 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 in comparison. So I think there's a lot there to be uh, proud, proud about. I mean, I'm going to make a sort of political point, and I've been trekking around Kingswood today for the by election, obviously, for my, for my party hopes to, to, hope to win. We also hope to form the next government, and I'm hoping that. We, we can we can lobby the next government to to give us more certainty as regards our funding with longer term settlements rather than this one year sort of appeasement approach where I think Councillor Jeffrey mentioned about the filing grant is going up and down and you're given with one hand tag with the other it does make it really difficult it's always so last minute as well you've heard about it in December and 
been the latest thing we had in January when the <laughs> government were running, councils were running out of money. I mean, trust me, in our local authorities, we're all in a very, very different situation in terms of the, the, the gravity of the situation facing local government. Uh, but we were thrown an extra stop of 600 million, and I think we got 350 on the fire. This, this is not a great way to run uh, a budget, really, o overall. So I'm, I'm hoping that the next government, well, it might be a different government than one I want to support, but will give some certainty to, to, to local government and also to the to fire services and continuity of budgeting that can help. And okay, that may change due to you know, events like inflation and extra, but money needed to support, certainly I'm the Council of Social Care in Reading, and I know that the pressures there are really, really heavy. So we might need to support more, but at least we have the certainty of knowing what we're going to get over a longer period. So look, other people have said the 10 firefighters, that, that's brilliant. And as I understand it as well, that some of the recruitment around the latest, latest batch is showing a lot more diversity um, and you know, in, in terms of the, the, the cadre that's being being recruited, so that so that's really good. It's a turnover of staff, but obviously we can we can start to sort of meet some of our goals that we've spoken about, making the, the more diverse, obviously more, more female firefighters, and, and, and all those type of things. And they do. It's 163,000 saving on the overtime budget in the papers for that, because although you know overtime is a way of making sure we have the number of pumps on the run, it's not the most satisfactory way of doing that. I mean, there are costs of training firefighters and there's just the disruption and the turnover. We need to try and prevent that. There's going to be a working party, I think, in the new year to, to talk about that. Because we're losing a lot of people to other services as near the end of their career for reasons we know about, doing London waiting allowance and things like that. Um, we, we need to sort of try and stop that churn because there's a real cost as well to, to recruitment. As well as it, it can be good things, also there's a cost and all the extra training. That, so we're going to talk about that when we get to the next item on the automatic fire alarms, but there's a cost, there's a cost involved. So while it's good to give welcome new people, we would like to try and make sure not so many people are going out, 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 out the other end. So the 10 fire that, 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 that that's really good. The ITT stuff, yeah, we need to modernise. I mean, AI is becoming a big thing now. Um, I went to a, 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 a conference on our social care in Norfolk, and the fire, authority, the fire service there are playing a big role. They're using AI to predict when older people, some of us do fall in, start fall in this category, are going to maybe fall over, they're at risk, and they get a phone call from, from the council saying, look, we've looked at the stats here from the health service, you might be at risk of a fall. Or, and so the fire service there is helping with that, doing more safe and visits, so it's a way you tie things up. AI is going to play a really big role, but it also help, you know, help us save money in terms of what else in the future. So, so that investment's good. It's great that we're also, you know, in terms of funding, in terms of sustainability stuff, um, we're, 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 we're improving that, we're putting in LED, we're putting in solar panels, and Councillor Shepherd and Bay will probably talk about those later, but that, that's really good. That's something we made a priority in that last year when we started to run the um, authority that we're going to spend a lot more emphasis on that. And Whitney Wood, that's obviously in Reading, that's going to get a big revamp. I think there's a meeting tomorrow where we're going to be on site where councillors, I know, are supportive of it. We'll, we'll see that. So that's all good. But again, even with that, we do need to have some certainty of funding because longer term, if you look at the purpose of our station, we, we, we need to find the funds to complete complete the programme. So the, everywhere's under a little bit of pressure. So welcome the budget, welcome we, we, we can do it, keep good value for money, 2.9 below the rate of inflation. But as I say, there's still some challenges and I think hopefully we can, we can help address those in the future. But thanks to everybody um, involved, because I thought it was a really great piece of work. Thank you very much, Vice Chair, and uh, looking forward, I mean, if the next government is yellow, then people like us will make sure that the new Prime Minister, with his Liberal Democrat uh, background, will, um, will consider the policy made. We'll see. Uh, moving, moving swiftly on. Um, Councillor Smith, are you going to now introduce the Efficiency and Productivity Plan? I'll go right through the reports and then I'll look at the recommendations on page 12, I think it is, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> 14, 12. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm doing it here. No, I'm sorry. Sorry. No apologies. Yeah. Over to you, Councillor. Okay. Um, in the efficiency and productivity plan, uh, it does set out exactly where we're going to um, produce um, our savings and our income. We'd better get £30,000 from renting the service houses, which we had a long discussion about at the Management Committee some time ago. We're going to uh, achieve £49,000 worth of savings from changing the way we do things. 
we've already spoken about the safety and well visits to uh, change the folks of those. £142,000 from contracts, uh, negotiations and savings, and in particular, a huge £344,000 from improved ways of work. All of those add up to uh, a significant sum in excess of half a million pounds. So, that's what we want to say about it. I don't know if still add to that. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I suppose just to add that um, the second part of the um, efficiency and productivity plan um, focuses on productivity um, and it details projects and um, that we will be delivering um, over the medium term. Um, during 24-25 um, we will be considering how to respond to automatic fire alarms as has been said and to make sure that our operational force is used in the most productive way. Um, we'll also be looking to continue to deploy new technologies throughout the organisation and with the aim of streamlining our business processes um, together with provision of real-time information to aid management decisions. So I just wanted to point out that the work plan um, in relation to productivity um, is shown on uh, page 37 of the um, and it's something that's been worked on um, on a monthly basis in terms of delivering that uh, those productivity works. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Any questions or comments please from members otherwise I'm going to press on to the strategic asset investment framework. Back with you Councillor Smith. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the things I think is important for, for all the members. One of the things I think is important for all of us to, to recognise is, is the morale boost that staff will get in the junior or the non-senior ranks um, from seeing us investing in the equipment they use, in the buildings that they, they work in and, and stay in, etc. That should not be underestimated. Um, I think that, that there is, um, I think the right words, there will be a particular bonus from that which you will not be able to monetize. But it, it is important. So we are going to spend something like 5.3 million on the new training centre at Whitley and also in upgrading Langley, which we talked about. And we already have the ongoing work at, um, at SLAM. We've got a variety of uh, investor save projects, particularly in the sustainability area, which uh, um, Dave McElroy has um, initiated, I think, and is carrying through. Some of them are absolutely no brainers and will, will um, produce particular, pro uh, particular income, as well as reducing our impact on, on the environment. And, um, we don't get anywhere these days without uh, ICT and that will enable both efficiency gains and productivity. And there are lots of other small projects and we will no longer have the second eldest fleet of vehicles in the country, which I think is, is really a step forward. Um, the cost of new training centre has increased slightly but the, the project firms up but all of this within the contingency. I can't go whether you want to add the you will want to add to that. Yeah, so thank you, Councillor Smith. <coughs> so the, the Strategic Asset Investment Framework um, is a framework which sets out the authority's uh, capital needs over a 10-year period. Um, but this particular uh, refresh of our um, Strategic Asset Investment Framework um, envisages front-loading of investment in our properties. So we're, we're looking to improve the fabric as well as reduce the services and carbon footprint. Um, so I, I think that's most important um, to make that point because uh, previously, in terms of our property, we've been concentrating on very big builds, um, new builds. We're now looking to spread um, our, our kind of capital program across all of the uh, stations, all type stations, with major refurbishment works. And we're looking to do uh, the majority of that over the next four years. And, and those costs are built into the medium term financial plan. So I think it's worth pointing out that um, we are front loading investment in properties um, as we've done previously uh, with Fleet. Um, and we would envisage that after that, that, is, uh, that four year period, we would then be in a more steady state position um, and we'd be using our um, directly funded. Um, revenue budgets to um, meet the, the needs in terms of fleet equipment and ICT. So I'll stop there. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I think it's worth reflecting, and, and some members who go back quite a long way, just what the, how the estate has changed. This building, we were in some fairly basic accommodation in D Road. We look at the um, new new fire station at Thea, Hungerford. Um, there's more, I can't remember the more, Crowthorn. Um, the estate has changed dramatically, and now we're going to add a you know, fit for purpose, modern training centre. Uh, it's, it's a terrific journey we've been on for several years, and we're plotting the way ahead as well. So, uh, really, really very glad to be here. Any, any comments on the strategic, strategic asset investment framework? Then we'll go on to Treasury, please, Mr. Smith. Okay. Um, the uh, investment strategy. We always be first in and ensure that we uh, have uh, we ensure the security of what we invest in. And also to ensure that we are able to liquidate those investments as and when we require them. And lastly, consider what we will get as a return. And all that is against the backdrop of being sure that we are being responsible and ethical with the public's money. We do have ambitious plans uh, for investment, as you've just heard, worth nearly £10 million over the next few years. And this is nearly 70% funded from the proceeds from D Road, the uh, sale which keeps giving. So we've just had uh, some more money from overages uh, that the uh, developer will, will achieve. Um, it walks, so the rest will be coming from revenue next year. We're not going to be borrowing very much. Our projected indebtedness is over £600,000 below our capital funding requirement, which is a really good and necessary position to be in. And we are not going to borrow in advance of need trying to make money um, playing Monopoly um, by investing in a better rate than we get in the first place. It's just too risky and it's just not necessary. As a final point, um, we introduced last year, I think, the uh, ratio of financing costs to net revenue stream to make sure that we are being uh, responsible. And I'm pleased to say that it shows clearly that we are well under that limit that we set ourselves. Over to you, Can you just give us um, some thoughts? Because your, your forecasting here some interest rate movements. You're forecasting here some interest rate movements. And the actual reading today, have they maybe been pushed back, bringing us down? Um, that will be affecting this. So I wonder if you're computing that, computing within your thinking. Yes, um, certainly, Chair, and that is built into the interest uh, uh, receipts and projections going forward, so we are um, anticipating reduction <coughs> in um, interest rates uh, over the next year, and we get to have half a percent. Um, also, as I go through, we, we will be seeing that our balances will be um, severely deflated. We can cut the programs as well in terms of investment income that are there. I'll go through the cut tables in the Treasury report and bring that up. So, um, starting on page 72 of the uh, pack, um, first table um, shows anticipated capital expenditure over the next four years. So, the figure for 24 to 25. Include some slippage um, from the current year, that's mainly due to the long delivery times on vehicles. Um, the second table shows the capital expenditure can be funded from capital receipts, the development fund, and direct revenue funding up until uh, 24 25. And after that point, the authority will need to borrow to finance the proportion of this capital program. So the table on page 73 shows the capital financing requirement. So this is the total amount of historic debt outstanding that's not being paid for from revenue account reserves and capital receipts. So the table shows the capital financing requirement increasing um, from 25 to 26, and confirming that the authority will need to borrow in these years to finance part of its uh, capital program. The graph on page 74 shows the liability benchmark, which is an indicator of future borrowing needs. Um, it's significantly below the amount of outstanding loans in 23-24 due to the capital receipt um, from the sale of D Road. 
However, as that uh, capital receipt, as well as a proportion of reserves, is spent over the coming four years, and the liability benchmark comes back in line with outstanding debt. The table on page 75 shows investments falling by nearly half in 24-25 as capital receipts are spent on funding capital programme. Um, the table on page 76 shows debt increasing from 8.9 million to 13.9 million over the four year period of the medium term financial plan. It's anticipated that the authority will take out new loans of six million pounds and repay maturing loans um, of about <coughs> one million. So to summarise the borrowing position of the authority, the capital programme over the next four years is an ambitious one, but it does remain affordable. Uh, as we said before, the ratio of financing costs to net revenue stream um, as set out on page 86, but they do show um, a slight increase from 2.25% in 22-23 to 2.95% in 27-28. The Chair has been keen to ensure that um, members get assurance in terms of the affordability over the medium term of our capital programme and therefore we have those maximum limits in relation to the ratio, um, which are currently set at 2.5% and will rise to 3% by 2027-28. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I think uh, those fiscal rules are important to be able to measure the borrowing against what you, uh, what you believe is appropriate and can be shown on page 86 very clearly that we remain underneath our, uh, our ratio. Again, members, uh, questions or comments, statements, please. And then we're on to um, the final one, uh, reserves policy, please, uh, Councillor. Okay, um, just a few highlights. At the end of 22-23 financial year, we had a revenue deficit of £733,000. We uh, plugged that by drawing funds down from our uh, budget contingency reserve. However, we wanted to provide resilience going forward, so we have replenished that by £573,000 this year, as was indicated in last year's budget. And we have no intention of doing that on a regular basis, but life can be uncertain. So we intend to maintain a budget contingency reserve of 3%, uh, in earmarked reserves, and a general reserve of 5%. We've also assessed the hazards that together with likelihood might be needed at just under £2.3 million. So for example, last year's green book payable was 35% higher than budget. So we have some resilience against that. As at 31st of March, we estimate we will have over £15 million in all reserves, but these were almost halved over the year as the projects are delivered, but will still include general reserve of nearly £2.3 million. So a reasonably healthy position. Yeah, thank you. So you just wanted to add that um, under section 25 of the Local Government Act 2003, um, the Chief Finance Officer is obliged to report on the robustness of estimates and the adequacy of the proposed financial reserves. So as has been said, um, we will be maintaining the budget contingency reserve at 3% of the revenue budget, and this will deal with any unforeseen in-year budget pressures. But in addition, we've also got the general reserve that will be maintained at 5%, and this will provide short-term emergency funding from um, any high-impact events that, that may uh, occur throughout um, the following year. Um, so just in, in summary, I believe that the reserves will remain adequate over the, over the medium term um, because of the maintenance of those two reserves. <coughs> Uh, question. So I'm going to slightly abuse the agenda. I suppose this could come into the uh, the, the sort of um, area of, of reserves. But I know the, in the follow-up agreement beforehand, Councillor Griffiths was going to ask about the maternity um, si situation through the maternity for, for our female firefighters in particular, and whether that's been built into the budget, because it wasn't clear. I know it's it, it, difficult to quantify. I'm raising now because it's difficult to quantify necessarily what that might come to, but that there has been allowed by because I know that was a request by the by the FBU as part of the campaign to put and make sure the budget goes towards the top of the table. Yes, that, that, that has been incorporated into the budget as part of the budget things. 
tremendous. So I didn't mention it earlier, but I think it's important to say that because we, you know, looking after the staff is, is especially in these sort of areas is really important to us. So I talked slightly music, but that's great. I think it's important for the avoidance of doubt that we make very clear, and it's been said already, but I'll say it again. We're going to use some of our reserves. We're going to use them for the reason they're there. Um, it does show that the reserves actually move downwards, but not in an unhealthy manner. We are ready to spend on the next stage of our development of our assets. And uh, I look forward to those coming online. So again, any questions on this reserves uh, statement? Then I'm going on to yeah, the next one, which is fees and charges. Um, you all know what these are like. You do them in your local authority every year. Again, uh, Councillor Smith, are you introducing these? There's not a, a huge number of them. Uh, I need to say that this is, uh, these are not something that come came for the local working group or indeed the Managing Committee, but basically it's a 4% uplift on last year, which really takes account of inflation. Um, well, you might not say. And just to say really that these are a very um, minor part of um, any income that we get through. Um, so in terms of income generation, um, as it's been built into the efficiency plan, uh, we're looking to get um, additional income from two of our um, from service houses, um, so that's £30,000. So um, certainly in terms of any income we get, this is very minor, and other income we get is, is things such as last income, telecommunication last income, and also cross-border income, which are much more significant. So um, very minor um, parts of the budget to get us. I think we're noting it, and, or no, we're going to approve it later, but we're noting it for this part of the debate. Uh, and then in terms of early fire control service budget, will you introduce that? Please? Yes, so um, the TPFCS budget um, is presented to joint committee in December each year, and therefore the assumptions, um, particularly around pay, can be different from the assumptions that appear in the authority's medium-term financial plan. Um, so the TBFCS revenue budget um, will increase by 8.9% in 24-25. Um, the main factor for the increase in the budget requirement relates to the level of pay awards agreed um, for the current year and last year, as well as the estimate for 24-25. So the current year's um, budget is based on a pay award of 4%, whereas the actual pay award agreed was 5%. Um, similarly, a provision for 5% was made in 2022 um, for the pay award then, but that turned out to be 7%. Now for 24-25, the assumption is 5%. Um, there's also been an increase in employer contributions um, to the local government pension fund um, in Berkshire. So in terms of the, the capital programme for TVFCS, there's only one area of identified expenditure, which is a technical refresh of the integrated command and control system and the cost of £665,000. Um, the authority, along with partners, will contribute £50,000 to the renewals fund in 2024-25, taking into account contributions, interest earned and expenditure the Renewals Fund is expected to stand at just over 1.3 million at the end of 24-25, of which the authority share will be £435,000. And the Renewals Fund will be required to pay for a full system replacement by April 2030, when the agreement and all current system contracts expires. Thank you, Chair. Grateful for that, Connor. Um, again, okay, no, nobody's indicating so I'm really looking to move to resolution of our budget for 24-25. And I'm going to read out the recommendation. I'm going to ask for your support in taking these on block. If you want to get home, you'll take them on block. Otherwise, there'll be eight named votes, uh, nine of them. Um, so I, said, I recommend we take them on block. I've even got Councillor McElroy agreeing with me there, so I'm, I'm nearly home. So we've got, let, let me just rehearse them now. 2.1, approve and increase, pay five, in the precept of 2.99% of 
2.2, approve the medium term financial plan. 2.3, approve the efficiency and productivity plan. 2.4, approve the strategic asset investment framework. 2.5, approve the prudential indicators treasury strategy and investment strategy. 2.6, approve the reserves policy. 2.7, approve the fees and charges uh, as set out in appendix two. 2.8, approve the TBFCS revenue and capital budgets 24-25 as set out. I would like to propose that and I've got a secondary in Council Mike Smith. We will now go through and you'll run the name vote. Um, thank you, Chair. This will be a, a roll call of members by surname, alphabetical order. When faith announces your name, please indicate whether you are for, against, or abstain. Over to faith. Thank you. Councillor Pendlebury. Councillor Pendlebury. Councillor Pendlebury. Councillor Drummond. Four. Councillor Fuwa. Four. Vice Chair. Four. Thank you, Councillor Griffiths. Four. Thank you, Councillor Hillier Simons. Four. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Jeffrey. Four. Thank you. Councillor Mackenzie Boyle. Four. Thank you. Councillor Morgan. Four. Thank you. Councillor McElroy? Four. Councillor Reynolds? Four. Councillor Shepherd Bay? Four. Councillor Stedmund? Four. Councillor Mike Smith? Four. Thank you. Councillor Taylor? Four. Thank you. Well, I think that's a real statement of support for the work that's been done, for a budget that I think is an excellent one for the people of West Berkshire and the service. Thank you so much and thanks for everybody's work tonight. Right, Mr. Devon, then, uh, automatic fire alarm consultation. This is going, we are proposing this goes out for consultation. We've had members here who've been working on the task, the task group um, and this was gone through a management committee. So it's had a pretty good airing. I am going to ask uh, Mr. Powell and Mr. Bremble to introduce it, but uh, members, I'd rather hope you've got a decent handle on what we're trying to do here. Uh, over to you, Mr. Bremble, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Um, the report that is put forward to you tonight sets out a recommendation to consult for 10 weeks with the public on the changes of how the service responds to automatic fire alarms, also known as unwanted fire signals. The reason for this consultation are there is a shift nationally to reduce these types of incidents. This has come from the Home Office for the Fire and Rescue Services to reduce attendance at these incidents and to increase productivity within their services. Our most recent HMI CRFRS inspection recommended that the service should ensure it addresses effectively the burden of false alarms, which is another reason for putting forward this consultation. And through our corporate plan and community risk management plan, the Fire Authority recommended in priority five that we address these types of incidents with a view to reducing them, the impact on operation crews and businesses. <clears throat> in looking into the background and some uh, research on our current situation within the service, currently 45% of our incidents are automatic fire alarms, of which 99.3% of these incidents no action is required. That's in the buildings that we're putting forward the proposals on. In compiling this report, officers looked at um, 20 different fire and rescue services on how they've changed their response to these types of incidents. This varies um, from not attending at all, except for on uh, specific uh, circumstances and exceptions to certain buildings, or only attending during the day and not attend. Uh, Apologies, only attending during the night and not during the day. So there is a various um, different approaches across the, count, uh, the country which this aligns to as well. Automatic fire alarms cause disruption to essential activities for crews such as safe and well visits and essential and critical training, all of which of these have to be rescheduled. So when the crews go out to, to these types of uh, events or incidents, Anything that they were doing at that time needs to be rescheduled for further on into another uh, time within the day or into the following tour, which then has an impact on other work. 
They also cause disruption to businesses in waiting for us to attend, which is a loss of time in their business. By reducing the number of automatic fire alarms we attend, this will increase productivity within our crews and on our stations and reduce the risk to the public through increasing our prevention activities. The consultation puts forward three options that the service wishes is, wish to consult the public on. In order to see the most benefit to the service and bring us somewhere in line with the national average, which is currently running at 39% of incidents, our preferred option would be option three. These consultation, this consultation only proposes changes of our response to premises that come under the fire safety order. These types of premises have a responsibility under the order to manage their building in terms of false alarms and alarm systems. There is no proposal to change our response to domestic property, residential properties either. And we will always respond to any 999 call for a fire. <clears throat> We have amended the document following management committee on the suggestion of the chair by adding a flow diagram uh, to illustrate how calls would be handled in various scenarios for the public to understand better. And from comments that from Councillor Helia Smith Simons during the management committee and a follow up email, we have added in a paragraph three on page 33 to try and address some of the concerns about uh, risk of unoccupied buildings overnight as well as we will create a document of frequently asked questions to outline uh, various things that are raised through members um, and through ourselves to try and address the concern of the risk involved in this change of approach. I would like to thank the members of the Task and Finish Group for their help in creating this consultation document and the Members Workshop for their input on it, which has also been invaluable. We're not hearing you. No, I might stop. Um, to back on that. So I'd like to thank members for the input onto the paper and the consultation document. It's been invaluable for your, uh, in creating this document to go for consultation. I'd like to hand to the vice chair, who is also lead for community risk management plan. Uh, before others, um, a lot of work's gone into this, mm -hmm. and I'm grateful to members. So. We just remind ourselves, and it sounds obvious, that it? But we're simply going out for consultation. We don't need to give our view before we go out for consultation. And Mr. Rumble, although you did say your preferred option, option three, you're going to need to keep an open mind, sir. You're going out to consultation, sir. And I can't strike that from the record, but actually, I think we've got to make sure we go out and say we are listening and all options are open. Do you mind if I make that clear, please? Yes, that's fine, Chair. Well, all options are open on the consultation. We will uh, conscientiously consider all the options and the feedback from the consultation. Very great to you. So really, we're looking at comments on this consultation document. And with the, with the point, I'll bring in momentarily, that the FAQs will be added and, and Pauline, I'm going to hand over to you now because I know you've got a particular concern, but please come in. Thank you. I was also going to comment about um, that uh, small sentence that says that the fire service likes option three best. I, I was going to suggest we don't conclude that sentence at all. But I would, would like to talk about schools. Um, and I, I'm grateful to you that you've picked up um, the email that I sent you. But I just wanted to um, expand on that a little bit because I don't know whether any of you have been to a school that's just had a fire, but the consequences are quite devastating. Um, there's the loss of work for a start, and a lot of it is examination work that just can't be replaced. And if any of you have got teenage children, you can just put yourselves in their minds as to how they would feel if they lost their exam work. Um, then there's a logistical problem, um, we're all on the local authority. Where in your borough would you find a, a space to put several hundred children overnight? Because that's what you would have to do. Uh, plus all their desks and chairs and laptops and books and all the other accoutrements and so on. And then the parents would have to take them to wherever that place was, that could be miles 
from where they live. And the sheer financial cost of all of that is absolutely huge. Um, we don't have a lot of school fires in this county, thank goodness, but most of the fires that do happen in schools come from arson, disaffected pupils very often, um, and they happen during the night. And so bearing in mind what I sort of um, talked about the consequences, I don't think it, it's a risk worth taking at all. And I was actually going to make a, a formal proposal that we had in eight words on pages <coughs> 11, 12 and 13, same words on each page, that in the box at the bottom, the second bit where all of the writing is in red, after it says we will continue to send fire engines to automatic fire alarm notifications from residential homes, that we add in the words and to schools between 6 p.m. and 8 a.m. Right, if we could put that in all of those three options, then I would be content. And I'd like to make that as a formal proposal, please. Do you have a second, her Councillor Paul? Yeah. Councillor Mackenzie Brown, thank you. Um, from the chair, I understand the point you're making. I wish it had come out during the during the working party. I wish it had come out before tonight, really. Um, I'm, I'm a little torn, I'll be honest with you. Yeah. I know that we wish to add frequently asked questions. And I think we've really looked at this upside down and backwards. And, well, we will put your proposal, but I'm struggling at the moment in my mind to know whether I would support it or not. Vice Chair, you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, obviously, Councillor Harris Solomon's obviously raises issues after the management committee, and as I said, I think they were partly addressed by by some of the comments made. And I think I think you're right, Chair, in a sense that we the preference here is he, he, amongst property professional officers at the moment is option three, but we do have to obviously take on board the comments of the public in the consultation. So I suppose in in a certain respect. Those comments may well be made through the consultation process, and that when we get to the actual vote amongst members, I suppose Councillor Henry Simons is quite within her rights also to raise that as an amendment to the actual policy we so, so we agree. Because I think you were quite clear at the start that we were this was only a, we were only really agreeing to the consultation rather than debating the policy. So it appeared to me that we'd be sort of you know with respect to I, I and I perfectly take on board your. Uh, Councillor Simon's concerns over this, and I suppose this, this it does boil down to the fact that this is about you know it's community risk management plan. This is about managing risk, and at the moment, you know the the risk of that happening in a school um, at night and um, without somebody being alerted and with fire engines going anyhow is really quite low. And I suppose the other thing I thought I made, you know, we, I mean, I'm, Her Majesty's Inspector is watching tonight and. This is an important item because when we were inspected last time, you know, I think it was raised that we we were, if you like, on the wrong side of this in terms of the statistics. We were too much time amongst or for our crews was was wasted. Ninety nine point three percent of the time, so went out, of the, and forty six percent of calls. It's in this staggering amount of time on calls where they weren't needed and they could be doing training. So. I think that you know we do need to address this. We had a go previously at this, and I think the consultation is the first stage. So, long-winded way of saying, I think let's do that part of it after we've had the result of the consultation and see whether members of the public pick pick that up and make those comments, and then perhaps we could vote on it then. Um, that would be my would be my view of it. Not to say it's not an extremely valid point, Councillor Simons, and we you know all take on board that. I've got Councillor Sermon, Councillor Kenzie Brown, Councillor Henry Simons, you, you will get a chance to talk again to your proposal. Uh, I'm looking for others to break cover, they're not at the moment, so you've got the floor, Mr Sermon. Councillor Sermon. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> so, uh, I was on the um, task group for um, AFA. I must apologise because I didn't actually pick up this. It was a conversation we had just before this meeting uh, about the schools. And what I was concerned about, this will, when this is approved, it will become a public document. 
And what we were worried about is that people will be aware that we'll be no longer attending school fires, um, AFA uh, alarms for schools. Students will be aware of that and they will know that you will be able to do damage and know that nobody will actually turn up. So that was one of my concerns about, the, um, about this proposal. The other thing as well is that it came out in our conversation that a lot of our schools don't have sprinkler systems. I think I'd be happier if schools had sprinkler systems, then we could get away with not attending overnight. But a lot of our schools are old, uh, so often they don't have the systems in place. So that's a, a risk I think that we can't afford to take. Going back on what Pauline actually said about um, you know trying to find an alternative building for schools, uh, etc. I mean, we're struggling to actually house our students as it is without actually trying to find additional accommodation if something actually happens. So that was the justification behind this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mackenzie Rowe, please. Thank you for that. Um, can I just say that don't be surprised, therefore, Councillor Gittings, if the public come back and say there are after school clubs between six and nine, I know at my kids' school that happens. So I think we've got to be aware that that may come back from the public consultation. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'd like to contribute myself if I may, and then I'm going to bring you back. I've got. I'm going to bring it back at the end to summarise your proposal. I'll take Councillor Smith, please. Oh. Thank you. Um, well, I suppose one of the things that occurs to my mind is how many schools have really comprehensive automatic fire uh, alarm systems rather than just a manual push alarm for evacuation in the school during its occupied time. And we're not saying we're not attending, we're just not going to attend on the on a, on a just a automatic fire alarm, we need to confirm that. So, and the schools are, they said, I appreciate there will be a huge loss of the capital asset and uh, the disruption that causes. But I think this probably is a question to be considered either from the result of the consultation or after the consultation. <coughs> Mr. Bremble wants to come back. Did you, you don't have to? No, no. Good. Um, I'll take it a second, Billy. What I'm, why I'm told is that the officers are coming up with their professional advice that we consult on these options. It is clear in here that we won't be going to schools. We can see the schools, the, the blackboard and the, and the children. So the public shouldn't be unaware, those who respond, those who review this, that we won't be attending schools unless we get confirmation. And therefore, the consultation will do its work from the from the chair. I think that's where where I'm at. I, I've got Councillor Drummond. I think I've got Councillor Taylor. Um, Josh. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Drummond. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. I've been on the automated fire panel and just a little informative. I knew nothing about the FA about automated fire alarm before I joined the Royal Bachelor Authority last year as a new boy. I was surprised to find out the false alarm account of 45% of all instances and 99.3% of automated fire alarm notifications require no further services. Of those that were actual incidents, particularly the premises subject to consultation, the impact was minor. I'd like to thank officers Paul and Jim for their knowledge and they passed on to us in the panel and I'd be happy in supporting the automated fire alarm consultation. Thank you, Chair. That's Reynolds. Thank you, Chair. Um, on first thought, on reading this paper, I have very similar thoughts to the thoughts of Councillor Helia Simons. But I think the point that you raised earlier, Chair, is really important. The difference between the consultation and the implementation of the paper. We'll go out to consultation. The consultation and the residents might come back to us for option one, two, three, a combination of the three, or actually something very different that they feel is the right way to go. Um, I wonder, however, whether it might be appropriate, given that we're, given there's concern in the room specifically about schools, that this consultation gets sent specifically to all of the schools directly as an addition in there, rather than just being published online, we go out that extra measure to specifically send it to the schools, asking for their feedback. And then we've got that extra catch in there, potentially, which might help in some of these situations. Thank you. And, and so the way I want to take this forward is that, um, I would imagine, Mr. Rimmel, Ms. Powell, the frequently asked questions 
could add one that will you automatically attend school fires and you answer the question therein. So it's not masked or disguised within the document. But Councillor Hill Simons, if you'd like to sum up, then we will put your proposal, your it's an amendment I know basically. Thank you very much for listening and, and I think Councillor Reynolds' idea is a superb one and um, if, if the schools get the document I think they will respond. Um, I just want to reinforce that this is only during the night that we're talking about where there would be nobody there to confirm it one way or the other. Um, and with respect to what the Vice Chairman said, I don't think parents would automatically think about it. Um, I think it's only those who've been involved in schools um, that it would occur to. And uh, I mean, there are very, very few fires in this county in schools, and, and that's why I don't think it would occur to most parents to enter their heads. That's really my response to Vice Chairman. Thank you. And, and therefore, before I put your amendment, um, the idea of sending it to schools, it will be very interesting to see the response from schools, won't it? And that's very helpful, Councillor Reynolds. I'm going to put this now, show of hands. Um, to, to that proposed amendment, Chair, yes. Yes, that amendment. Those for the amendment, please show. Those against, please show. That amendment is therefore lost, but you get a second bite of the cherry when it comes back. So um, we are pressing on. I'm now going to put the main substantive uh, proposal, which is a recommend that we agree a 10-week public consultation in March 2024 uh, at a specified date to be confirmed. Chief Fire Officer will be on to that. To inform future decisions now how we respond to automatic fire alarms and agree to the draft consultation document subject to delegating responsibility for any minor amendments uh, to the consultation of the Chief Fire Officer in consultation with the Chair of the Fire Authority and the CRMP lead member. All those in favour of the substantive motion now, please, recommendation, please share. Great. Thank you, Thank you so much. You are allowed to make a comment, Chief, any time you want. Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah. Very kind. Uh, thank you, members, for your support with that and, and for the uh, suggestions around uh, additional frequently asked questions or, or uh, and potentially for comments that will come back following the consultation, which we will give all due regard to, obviously. I just wanted to make a point to uh, the comment that I think Councillor Stedman made about sprinklers. Uh, and it is just another call to arms members because I completely agree. I, I am pretty certain that both staff at schools, certainly fire officers, uh, parents and uh, pupils at schools would feel much more confident and comfortable uh, were their sprinklers uh, in their local schools. Uh, schools come under the control of children's services, which you know are under the control of the authorities that you are all sent here from and, and represent uh, back in your constituencies. So I would encourage you extremely strongly uh, to lobby back in your local authorities with your children's services and education fun functions when they are either building new schools or refurbishing schools uh, or setting budgets to include the provision and the retrofit of split sprinklers into schools. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. We did go round this loop, I've taken a sec. We went round this loop of West Berkshire. I think we fudged it uh, because we said we'd look at each case on, on, on its merits as opposed to a policy of absolutely doing it and there, unless there are extraordinary reasons to not the other way round. Um, so I'm looking at Councillor Jeffrey, Councillor Drummond, who might wish to take that board at West Berkshire. Councillor Hannes Simmons, and then the Vice Chair. Sorry to keep on, but I, I really appreciate what um, the Chief Fire Officer just said. Um, we'll probably find that our officers are reluctant because of budgetary issues. And so what we did in Wokingham, I put forward a motion to the full council helpfully seconded by Rochelle Shepard Dubay, that we do put sprinklers in all of our schools. Um, in the end, what happened was that it was to go into new schools and new classrooms. And I think there's still a stage further that we need to go there to get it into all schools as well. But that may be the way you've got to go, actually through a formal motion at the full council and get, get all parties on board before you put it. And then the officers don't have any excuse 
I don't think officers give excuses, Councillor <laughs> Hallisons. I think reasons, and many of them sometimes as well. Uh, Vice Chair. Well, I mean, I think the word budget will probably be the would would be the answer. I mean, school budgets, whether they're I mean, some of them are in local authority control. Obviously, quite a lot of them now are under academy control. School budgets are under horrendous pressure. So let's not go into the politics of that. But I mean, it's a it's a massive issue. So I can see that to be the barrier because it's an extremely laudable aim. We, I mean, we're building one new, a new school in Reading, and I'm I'm looking in the direction of my colleagues, and we're going to. We check they've got sprinklers in there actually because it's just a very you know it's river academy it's a very apposite memory but it wouldn't it be great if we could have the i mean the resources to um to to ensure that and then actually in, in a strange way that there's kind of some of the issue around automatic firearms is somewhat slightly negated and it's also much safer i mean the, the form of past the chief officer of this um Mr. Cox was very keen on this. He was on the National Council. Those along the National Council remember that. So we've always promoted this as a as a policy across the authority, not just for schools, but for all all buildings. Um, why wouldn't we? But as I say, there is usually, there is a cost implication. But hey, let's let's, see, let's do what we can do, uh, and it's an important point to remember. Thank you, Chief Fire Officer, for that. Councillor Mackenzie, go on, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got nothing about. Um, about the forest, I will be lobbying for sprinklers in the new second school that we will be having on Buckner's Park. I think for me, we've got to, that, that, that assumption we will, rather than the assumption we will if it's appropriate. That's a big change of emphasis. And I certainly want to say that back to my spot. Thank you, members. Uh, I think we're done, we've agreed. Did we vote? Yes, we did vote. <laughs> it's so exciting here, I'm, I'm losing my way. Um, okay, we're on to number 12, and Lucy Grimo, who sat there patiently for all this excitement, is going to introduce the paper policy statement, please. Cool. Thank you, Chair. Um, as members are aware, we're required to prepare a pay policy statement each financial year in accordance with section 38 of the Local Housing Act 2011. The statement includes information on remuneration for all staff as defined by the Act. All information on staff and posts and salary for the purposes of the pay multiples are taken from data for the 31st of October 2023. Um, it's not been necessary to amend the format of the pay policy statement for 24-25, but a number of amendments have been made. The amendments for this year include an updated section relating to the pensions legislation relating um, to address age discrimination issues with legacy firefighter pension schemes, an updated section related to the second options exercise for retained firefighters. An update to the employer contribution rates for the firefighters pension scheme following um, the government attribute department revaluation. An updated section on the car users in line with changes to the car user scheme. An update of the section relating to enhanced mileage rates for casual, essential and leased car users. And also, um, and finally, um, inclusion of information relating to incidental mileage claims, flexible duty officers, level four officers, and those on a continuous duty rota. The authority is invited to approve the pay policy statement subject to any further amendments considered appropriate. I'm going to ask you to help me with two things, please. On page 49, which is five of the policy, under responsibility and scale, it says for 24-25, Army of Bay was directly responsible for a budget of 41.974.800. I think you mean 23-24. Yes, you're right on that. You're okay with that? Right. And now, second thing you know, I is on the agenda, you say, page uh, 12 on the agenda, to approve the pay policy statement, Phoenix A. On the agenda. In the report, you say to approve the draft pay policy statement. I think, I think we need clarity on that, please. Okay, so it is a draft until, until it's approved. Why is it a draft? Um, just in case there's any amendments that are needed by the fire authority. Sorry, it's not it's working. Um, it's only a draft at the moment just because pending any amendments, um, we haven't finalised it or published it yet, so essentially. If we don't have any amendments tonight, are we approving the policy proper? Yes. Thank you. Members. Clearly it's worked on... Let me just have a 
Uh, so hey pay scales come to bear, benchmarking across other authorities. Uh, you, you've seen this before. It's a process we follow. Uh, I'm very happy to propose that we approve the pay policy statement as drafted. How about that? <laughs> um, do I have a second? Councillor Shepherd Bay, thank you very much. Are there any comments? Because I think members are wishing to vote, and I'm going to therefore ask all those in favour, please. Uh, I think that's unanimous again. Unanimity has broken out this well, evening. Like poly, you know, this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think not. I mean, good gracious me. I've not been called Brezhnev before. I've been called Napoleon. Okay, thank you very much. We're then on to um, the Code of Conduct. Uh, okay, no, I think this is Lucy Green, mate. That would be me. That was you, yeah, sir. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Uh, Sorry, Lucy. I nearly threw you there completely, didn't I? Mr. Brett. Thank you, Chairman, members. Into the final furlong. Um, the re this report starts on page uh, 61 of your agenda pack, and for the benefit of newer members, the genesis of this report dates back to the publication of the report by the Committee on Standards in Public Life in January 2019 into the local government, into local government ethical standards. That report made many recommendations, some aimed at central government, others aimed at local government. In light of this, Faith Row undertook a benchmarking exercise of the authorities' ethical government governance framework against the Committee on Standards in Public Life's uh, recommendations. The authority adopted um, that committee's recommendations to adopt the LGA model code of conduct for members and that the code be reviewed annually, annually and in doing so, where possible, take into account the views of the public and other stakeholders. This report sets out the results of its second annual consultation, from which one could observe that although the consultation had a wide reach, there was little feedback and negligible adverse comment. In light of this, the recommendations from the Audit and Governance Committee are on page 61, and they invite the authority to note that feedback, but also to approve that the Royal Berkshire Fire Authority Member Code of Conduct consultation be held every three years, subject to any proposed updates for which the draft code of conduct document will be consulted upon soon. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Um, members, it's gone through audit and governance. Uh, I don't necessarily want to pick over it too much tonight. Uh, I'm not seeing comments. I'm therefore asking you to note the outcome of the second annual consultation, approve the Member Code of Conduct consultation that held every three years. Two for one, two point two. All those in favour. Thank you very much indeed. We then use forward plan, we note um, we note this uh, on page seventy seven seventy eight. Uh, it, it's obviously well adapted as required. Um, could you please indicate that you're happy for us to note this? Thank you very much. Not wishing to bowl you along here too much. And then the minutes of the standing committees, there's a recommendation to note them. There's a website link URL there. Um, again, all those in favour, 15 minutes of standing committees, we to note. Thank you very much. And then you don't have to vote for the meeting on the 22nd of April. You have to sort of so Except that it's there and turn up. Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. How did it go on, Katie? Just after eight. Thank you very much.